All right. Uh, so welcome to everyone. Uh, uh, this session, uh, we're joined uh, once again by uh, uh, Ms. Nora Rackley and Ms. Jackie Pierce from Lake Sumter State College. Nora is a librarian at the Leesburg campus, and Jackie is an uh, assistant professor, associate professor, one of those, uh, of English uh, at the Leesburg campus. So I will kick it over to them. Awesome. So our, our title today is Information Literacy is More Than Research. And uh, yesterday, uh, as Nora and I were going over the title, we don't like this title, but we are going to live with it. Um, what we really want to talk about here is how information... All right. Uh, so welcome to everyone. Uh, uh, this session, uh, we're joined uh, once again by uh, uh, Ms. Nora Rackley and Ms. Jackie Pierce from Lake Sumter State College. Nora is a librarian at the Leesburg campus, and Jackie is an uh, assistant professor, associate professor, one of those, uh, of English uh, at the Leesburg campus. So I will kick it over to them. Awesome. So our, our title today is Information Literacy is More Than Research. And uh, yesterday, uh, as Nora and I were going over the title, we don't like this title, but we are going to live with it. Um, what we really want to talk about here is how information literacy can be more than information literacy. Um, which would not have made a very good title, so it's probably just as well that this is the this is how it ended up. Um, but we want to talk about how we, as instructors and librarians, can help our students become discipline literate as they prepare to go into bachelor's programs and beyond. Since most of us are teaching them at the freshman and sophomore level, so let me. I keep hitting wrong buttons. There we go. Um, you, Jeremy gave us the best introduction. So I'll just say that is a real bookcase in my real office when I'm there. And you notice it is not well organized um, at all. So, uh, but Nora and I have been working together at Lake Sumter since I arrived in 2006. She has been there much longer than that. Um, and we have done a lot of work together for these presentations, but also just in our normal everyday teaching lives. Uh, Nora, did you want to give some additional intro? Um, I, I, you got it. <laughs> Pretty much it. Sounds good to me. All right. So our topics for this presentation, um, we're going to talk about setting goals uh, for assignments and for what you're looking for from your students in general. We're also going to talk about the different types of assessments that you can do, because most of the time when we think of doing research projects, um, especially if you're an English teacher like myself, you think of research papers. But there are a lot of other ways that we can incorporate information literacy, discipline literacy, and research into our courses that do not involve massive research papers, which as an English teacher, I will say I am all for, um, because the fewer research papers I have to grade, the better and I know some of you are with me on that. We're going to talk a little bit about showing versus telling versus asking. So a great deal of what you get back from students involves how you ask for it, how you tell them what you want, or how you show them step by step what you want. And we're going to focus on some strategies that have worked for us in particular, um, and also some of our colleagues who uh, may or may not be with us today, but they are certainly here in spirit um, with some of those strategies. So step one, of course, and those of us who've been heavily involved in assessment definitely know this uh, setting those goals things, right? Um, and I quoted the Spice Girls earlier today, but I want to do it again. Uh, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. And I think a lot of times when we are asking students to conduct research, we're not even 100% sure what it is that we really, really want from them, but we know that we need them to do research in order to learn something, right? So I feel like setting the goals is a crucial aspect of it. One of the first goals, of course, is what kind of research are you looking for from them? And we look at, of course, the differences between web research and library research. One of my personal issues with some of this, though, is that if I require them to use library research and library research only, I still cannot guarantee that they, do, that they know the difference 
between doing web research and doing library research. So I'm going to show you an assignment later that only involves library research, but I have my students do both um, for most of my classes at some point or another because learning to navigate those is so important along with knowing the difference between popular sources versus academic sources. And Nora is going to weigh in here because the library, of course, is a huge help when it comes to helping establish those goals. Um, one of the things that happens a lot of times is we really, as instructors, get tired of seeing students use wikipedia.com as their, or .org as their resource. We, we don't want to see the bad sources. So we don't want them to use them at all. But the problem with that mentality is that we're not teaching them how to evaluate a source. What makes a good source? If all they're seeing is bad sources, they're never going to be able to, um, if all they're seeing is good sources, I'm sorry, they're never going to be able to recognize a bad source. So teaching them the difference and really digging in there and really teaching them to evaluate sources is crucial to figuring things out, to having them say, oh yeah, okay, that's a bad source because, right? If they can articulate that, you've won at least half the battle, right? Um, popular versus academic. I mean, there's virtues to both. So it just depends on what your assignment is. It's not necessarily that popular sources are necessarily worse than academic sources. It's just that maybe they're biased. But so are academic sources, right? Because a peer-reviewed journal is trying, you know, you're doing a research project, you're trying to prove something. And you're going to be biased towards that outcome that you want to achieve. So there's still bias. Bias exists everywhere, and we need to teach them how to recognize it not how to just completely abolish it from their lives. Absolutely. I think the other key to that is the idea that if we are teaching students at the freshman and sophomore level, the chances of them being able to even navigate some of the really advanced information that will come from academic sources can be difficult. So if you want them to use those kinds of academic sources, you have to help build that discipline literacy. Um, whereas if they're using popular sources, they may still be researching in your field, um, but being open to letting them use some sources that they can understand without your handholding might be actually a good thing. So we're, we'll talk about that as one of the goals. Um, and of course, how do you communicate your goals with the learners? We've talked about that for years, um, you know, writing good assignments and that sort of thing. Um, if you weren't in the earlier session with Nora and I, we talked a little bit about how to, how to do that. And then as a person who studied a lot about online learning in recent years, um, how do we align those goals with the assessments and with the level of the course? I, for example, of course, teach mostly ENC 1101. And I do want them to write papers on topics that are of actual interest to them. So a lot of times I will have them do research papers that are in their field of study, but I am not educated in those fields myself. So if I've got a student writing about a really hardcore medical topic and they're using super academic resources, even I am not going to get that much out of those sources without getting some additional things. So thinking about where you're teaching, what you're teaching, and what you really want from them is going to be super important um, as you set the goals for the assignment. So I wanted to talk a little bit about different ways to assess this, right? So the standard research paper, of course, is great, and you probably, most of us will do those um, in most of our disciplines, but a lot of people, especially at the freshman and sophomore level, don't really need to have students write massive research papers. Um, they are going to write them when they get to their bachelor's degrees and beyond, so we want to teach them how to do it, but we also want to make it something that they can handle um, and, and have that success at. So I've got a few ideas that I want to share. 
One is to focus instead of research papers on responding to particular articles. And this is where you actually hand them an article, or maybe it's out of your textbook. Uh, you hand them an article and you have them respond to that specific article. So it's an article that you have already looked at, you know really well. If you just have them find an article, then of course, in order for you to know that they've responded correctly, you've got to go read that article. So I love the idea of doing a, a reading list, uh, a bibliography. I know that Peter Olin uses that in his philosophy courses. Then you take one of those articles or a specific one and you have them respond to it. Um, Typically, we might use that on a discussion board, but you can also use reading journals that are maybe a little bit more private. Um, I've done both. Uh, I, I feel like sometimes having students share their reading journals with the whole class, there's a benefit there, but then there's also sort of a downside in that if somebody's reading of a particular article is really off track, then as the instructor, I have to come behind them and, you know, help the rest of the class understand that, no, 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 that article about Hamlet was not really about aliens. It was really just about Hamlet. Um, so, you know, having to, having to do that, having those discussion boards on a shared article is fine, but then you as the instructor have to sort of police that and be aware of that. Um, I have become increasingly a fan of having students do bibliographies, um, specifically annotated bibliographies where they are giving me some evaluation of the sources, uh, because if one of the outcomes that I have to assess in our gen ed uh, assessments, and it usually is, is whether or not they understand the difference between um, a good article and a bad article. Unless they're writing an annotation for it, I don't know that they know the difference, right? So having them do the summary and the evaluation, and I'm going to share one of those assignments with you later. Presentations, and not even necessarily massive graded presentations. Um, one of the things I like to use, um, I don't I don't have any currently, and I haven't for the last couple of years, but I used to always teach the African American Lit class and the film class as three-hour night classes, right? So we had all this time, and I would have people go find a source and bring it back and then share it immediately on the fly. So no PowerPoints or anything like that, but just a presentation or, as I put it here, a research slash in-class sharing. Um, and there are certainly others that you can do in a lower stakes kind of thing, because I think that too is um, helpful in scaffolding those assignments to where maybe you're doing it just as a class activity and there are no grades assigned, but then they have to go find a different article for their research paper. Um, so having those skills build over time, of course, is key. Nora, I know you had some other um, suggestions for the outside of the box activities as well. Um, if you were at our last session, um, somebody brought up a great um, a resume idea where um, if it's a history class or something like that, they could do a resume for a historical figure and they could um, do some research on that person and put it in the style of a, uh, of a resume. Um, we have a lot of assistance for students um, doing not just bibliographies, but the annotations are really important because that's really what's going to get at what they're thinking, right? Um, and it's really, really great to be able to um, talk about that. Um, we have helped faculty create libguides for assignments um, that are kind of out of the box um, to teach students how to perform them. So uh, there are so many options out there, and it really just takes a spark of an idea to get us going with that. Yeah, I love the I love the resume idea. Uh, I love the idea of doing more activities that do not involve grades before you have them do the same kind of thing for a grade. And I think that is something I really want to get across with this, that, you know, if the only time you have them do research is for a major research paper that can literally make or break their grade in the class, you're, maybe they're not going to learn anything from that. Um, so having them do those scaffolding uh, is, is really important. So how do we guide learners to the light? I'm from Missouri, which if you don't know, is called the show me state. And so I'm a big believer in showing 
I want you to show me how to do something, not just tell me, and certainly not just ask me to do something. Um, we all had, I'm sure, as we were coming up through our own education, we all had those instructors in college who would just say, write a paper. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> how long is it supposed to be, right? I mean, I, I remember many instructors, many professors in not only undergrad, but in grad school who would just be like, write a paper and that, not give me any more information than that. Um, and I, of course, was left fe feeling fairly overwhelmed. We do need to ask them for what we want, but we also need to tell them, and more importantly, at the especially at our level of education, we need to show them how to do it. Um, one of the things that I have started doing a lot of, and this is primarily because of the online classes, but um, I do a lot of videos. I do a lot of my own videos where I am literally doing the research that I would expect them to do. Um, one of the things I love about Zoom uh, is that I can create a video that captures my screen and so I can literally walk them through how to use the LibGuide or how to research using Academic Search Complete for 1101. Um, if it's an argumentative paper, I will actually do a separate video walking them through how to use opposing viewpoints, for example, as one of our, uh, my favorite library databases. Um, when it comes to literature, of course, those specific databases, because just doing a general search doesn't help them understand what they're looking for. And this kind of goes back to that earlier idea of the difference between the internet and the library, or the difference between a popular source and an academic source. Let's face it, we, most of us, came through school at a time where it was obvious what we were looking at. Even if we had to go find it on microfilm. Oh, how I hated microfilm. I still hate microfilm. I used to like it. <laughs> oh, of course you did. That's why you became a librarian. Crazy people. Uh, <laughs> I hated doing that kind of research. I absolutely hated it because it was, it was difficult. It is so much easier now to research, but the downside of that is that every single thing we do is on the same web browser. So whether I'm using the library, whether I'm using a database, whether I'm searching for books, whether I'm searching for videos, whether I'm searching Google, I'm still using the same web browser. And so for students, how do we know the difference between those things? And I feel like that's where either having librarians come in and do those types of interventions or having them create videos if you're in an online environment and you want to just put the video in place. Um, I do a lot of them myself, but of course I also work with our librarians. So I really want you to think about that in, in the sense of, um, how am I asking for this information? Am I just asking or am I really telling them what I want and showing them how to do it? Because I think that's really the important key here. Um, Nora, I saw that there are a couple things in chat. If you could keep an eye on that, uh, I can't see it on my screen. So if there are questions or anything, feel free to jump in with those at any time. Um, no questions so far, just okay. liking microfilm or not. Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, you know. It takes all kind of people to make a world, um, as my friend's mother used to say. So strategies that work. One of the things I've mentioned earlier and I, we mentioned in the previous session was to supply an actual reading list. And this is something that for like Sumter instructors, a lot of our help from the library has been kind of in that direction. Because when you create a LibGuide, um, say I have one for my ENC 1102, the composition literature class, and Nora uh, will put up not only the story of the yellow wallpaper, which I want them to read, but she will also put some links to actual academic sources on the yellow wallpaper. Um, and so a lot of those things have become built in. Sometimes even in using a, a textbook, I know in literary anthologies, they don't always have articles that go with each story, but they do usually have at least two or three chapters where it's like an in-depth study of Emily Dickinson, for example, where it's like, here's all of her poems, but here are also some articles. Um, so having that framework already there for them, plus even if you ask them to do additional research, now they know what the right kind of research looks like. They get that sense from the language and, and from how it's put together. 
an in-class analysis of a target reading or article. And this is something that I do a lot of, um, and I often do in those point of view videos, where I will walk them through a, a, a specific article that I want them to understand. Now, there's a danger here. Because if you are teaching in an online environment and you are you are not having synchronous classes, so it has to be done on video, uh, think about how long it could take to walk a student through an entire 20-page journal article. Probably not the best use of video time, right? Because they're going to lose interest in it fairly quickly. But having something to get them started right, will we'll certainly help with that. Uh, specifying, of course, your source requirements and assignments is important, knowing what you really, really want, um, and also practicing what we preach. And Nora has some, some thoughts on, on the, uh, the last three here. Um, we really, really, I think we missed the, the opportunity to model behavior sometimes, right? Um, when we get information from students, when we provide information from students, when we give information from stu to students, we need to really focus on providing citations for those things. If we're asking them to do citations for us, whenever we get something from outside sources, we need to provide a citation for them to see us doing it. Right. And this is incredibly important at, in all disciplines, um, especially if you're using outside materials to teach in your class. Um, you're really getting that across that it's not only me. I'm not um, telling you that you have to cite your sources because it makes me devilishly happy. Right. I'm telling you because that's the right thing to do. And See here, hi, I'm doing it too. So it really gets that across, right? Um, having students realize that you don't know everything is also a really good way to do it. You know, showing them that you have to look up how to cite something, right? Even though you've done it for X number of years and you know how to do it, you have to look it up because you don't remember, that's wonderful. It's modeling that good behavior. It's modeling the fact that, hey, it's not just you. It's the professor as well, right? It's the librarian as well. One of the things that we do in um, our lib guides, especially for, for the literature classes, is that we provide um, those critical analysis articles that Jackie was mentioning in in the LibGuide for them. So if they have this story, they also have critical analysis side by side. And one of the things we found that we weren't expecting really was that students were getting, were then finding their own articles much easier because they knew what a research article was. They knew what it looked like. So they were finding their own critical analysis articles a lot better than just if they're told, oh, go find a peer-reviewed journal that has a critical analysis of the story, and they didn't know what they were looking for. So that has helped a lot. Um, we really talk about... Um, specifying the source requirements in assignments. We talk about making sure that if you want them to use academic sources, you tell them, I want you to use only peer-reviewed journals from the library's website. Make it a requirement. And that in that way, you're going to ensure that they're doing the right thing there. Um, if you don't require that, they won't do it, period. It's as simple as that. If you want them to use journal articles, you have to make it a requirement. You can't just say, well, maybe use academic articles, but I don't know. You might find something else. Yeah, no, <laughs> it can't be wishy-washy. It has to be exact, right? Um, because honestly, they, they're going to go the easy route. They're always going to Google it before they do anything else, right? Also, teaching them that Google is a great first stop, but it's not the final destination is a great point as well. The other thing that um, I wanted to mention on Nora's behalf here is that the more you can write down 
and put in a Canvas shell if you are using it, even for a seated class. If you can give them written assignments that the librarians or the learning center tutors can access when they come in for help, that's going to get you a lot better help. Um, because that's something that I think, you know, again, when we were in school, um, I don't even remember getting written assignments, usually even in handout form. It was just the instructor, the professor said what he wanted, uh, and I wrote it down in my notebook, and then I I had to remember as best I could if I got the gist of what he really said. Um, but of course, those days are kind of over. Most of us do use written assignments. Uh, but like Nora said earlier, um, if it's on a piece of paper and the student loses it, she's not going to be able to see what that assignment said. So if it's in a Canvas shell or if it's on your faculty website, if you, your school has those, um, that can make a huge difference if they're coming in for help. Um, I actually require my students to put a Wikipedia article on their annotated bibliography in ENC 1101. Not because I want them to cite Wikipedia in their paper, because I don't, but because I know they're going to look at it and I want them to build a citation for it and I want them to see how it compares with the information that they find elsewhere. Um, and of course, they, like me, I use Wikipedia every day. I mean, I'll be absolutely honest. I Google the heck out of things, right? Um, because I need quick information. I'm not writing a paper, um, but I, but I, you know, I, I, I navigate, I help them navigate that information. Um, for literature, Websites like SparkNotes, um, I love SparkNotes because it can help a student narrow down a topic. Not that it's a source for their paper, but it's something that can help them. So I actually do provide that link in my Canvas shell, but with the explanation that this is not a secondary source, this is a reference source. This is something that you use to help yourself get started. Um, much like most people encourage Wikipedia as a starting point, not as of course, as an ending point, but I, it all comes down to that practicing what we preach. Because if I write a course and I give my students a bunch of Wikipedia links and nothing else, then I'm not practicing what I'm preaching if I'm asking them to do academic research for their research papers. Um, so I think that's really a key thing there. So Jackie, got, uh, yeah, go ahead. Hold on, I'm going to interject here a minute. Yeah. Um, Karen um, Callis had said that um, when you limit a search by peer review articles, you don't always get just peer review articles. Do you really want a peer review article as an instructor or do you just want scholarly sources? Right. Um, so I, I love that question, but at the same time, as a librarian, I get this all the time. And my, my question is, what's a scholarly article? What does that mean? Is scholarly the journal of whatever, or is scholarly People magazine? Um, because just because it's in a database doesn't necessarily mean it's scholarly. So where are we with that? What, what do you mean, Karen, when you say a peer-reviewed article versus a scholarly article? What's the difference? Well, and, and while you, she's thinking about that, this is, this is exactly what we were talking about earlier with the fact that we're accessing these things using the exact same web browser, right? So if I'm using the library OneSearch, I'm going to get books, I'm going to get ebooks, I'm going to get videos, and I'm going to get articles of all stripes. So I'm still looking at it through the same lens, and even I sometimes have to think about, I mean, that name of a journal doesn't sound familiar, but just because it has the word journal in the title doesn't mean it's an academic journal, right? right. So ha learning and showing them how to navigate those things are important. Um, so Karen says that there may be journals like the Journal of Whatever, right. that even though they follow a lot of academic processes, don't have a peer review component. Okay, I see what you're saying. So absolutely. Um, and then we do have to stress that to students. We also, um, Ingrid makes a very good point about how there are book review articles that appear in a peer review journal. But they're book reviews. They're not really about the topic. And we have to tell literature students this all the time because they don't understand that. Um, and absolutely, we, we do have to teach them the difference. Um, and a lot of this is about teaching. Remember that we are at a lower level. We're, at the, uh, we're not really getting into the depth of their majors here. We're doing general education courses 
and they're not necessarily going to major in psychology or whatever it is, right? So we really have to be cognizant of the, the fact that really they're not experts yet and that they're not really delving into their discipline all the way yet. So we have to be cognizant that we have to introduce them to these things because they have no clue. Right. If you're not supplying a reading list, one of the ideas that Nora and I had talked about is at the very minimum, at the beginning of a course that's very discipline specific, why not give them some sort of a, a, a vocabulary list, a glossary of terms that they will only encounter in more advanced type things. And of course, sometimes that's provided in a textbook, right? Because most of the textbooks for the class, even OER, are going to have maybe that glossary. So maybe even talking about terminology and what, how to recognize. Um, one of my best examples, one of my favorite um, topics that students write about I don't know what's my favorite, but it's definitely one of their favorites. Um, in 1101, the freshman comp class, tons of people want to write about serial killers. And I don't care because I love me some serial killer writing. It's absolutely fun. Um, I watch serial killer documentaries all day on TV, so why not? But I don't expect them to be reading advanced psychological medical things about serial killers and what makes a serial killer a serial killer. Most of the types of things that I'm going to have them use are going to be from magazines, not from academic journals. Certainly maybe some of those journals like you mentioned earlier that have some academic credentialing, but it's not really a peer-reviewed process. I am perfectly fine with that. One of the big things that I have to get them to understand is what is the difference between news articles and magazine articles even because you know a news article on the newest serial killer is going to be up to the minute it's going to be like oh he was caught today it's not going to give you any insight usually into his background where a more in-depth magazine article would um, so that again comes down to that communication Nora was there anything else in the chat before I show the examples Love the glossary idea. Um, nope, that was it. So we've got two samples that I want to share with you. And the first comes from my um, esteemed colleague, Brenda Scocellis, who teaches, oh, what is showing on my screen, Nora? You know I'm no good at this. I don't know Earth why. science, you've got it. Okay. Oh, now I'm just we're back. seeing it. Okay. Yes, you're, yeah. You do, do what you just did because it worked. Do what I just did. I love it. I'll do what I just did. All right. So in Brenda Scocellis' Earth Science assignment, you will notice that there is an actual list of the publications that she wants students to use. Um, and Nora, I'm going to let you give the background on this because I know you were involved in the collaboration that created this particular assignment. Yeah, she really wanted to do an assignment um, that would get students to look at some publications that they wouldn't normally look at right, for earth science, and she had some specific ideas, and so we we developed ways of having them um, pull up those specific publications and just search them, right, so we created a LibGuide for her, we helped her tweak her assignment so that it was more specific, and we created a LibGuide that has a step-by-step -step instruction on how to do that, how to um, find these articles and find articles in there. Um, she's got some very specific instructions, if you'll scroll for a minute, mm -hmm. on um, providing a reference page, um, essays are submitted via Canvas, um, you need a qualitative and quantitative data results conclusions of the article in your own words. Um, notice how he or she, in the note, she um, talks about a critique. What is a critique? Um, so she tells them, tells them what she wants, what she really, really wants, right? So um, she says a critique is to analyze the pros and cons of the article. Is the author presenting good science or just opinion? Is the author a recognized expert? How could the article be improved? So she really does 
explain exactly what it is she wants to do here. Okay. The other assignment that I want to show you is one of my own. This is actually a brand new one, so um, you might expect that next semester I will be revising this because that's usually how this works. Um, we will see how it works in the spring of 2021. So in the Lit 2000 class, which is the Introduction to Literature class, I need them to do their own research because they're going to pick from the readings. Um, I wish I had time to give comprehensive <laughs> lists of readings for each one of them, um, but, I, but I really don't. So one of the things that we're going to do early on in the semester is to learn about researching. We're going to do that, I'm going to do that hands-on. Here's me showing you how to navigate the databases and how to look up ebooks that are anthologies. We're going to go through all of that so they will have that instruction. And then they're going to create an annotated bibliography using library resources, and I don't specify it has to be peer-reviewed, notice it's it can be anything from the library, um, but I point out I would stick to ebooks for ease of access, journal articles, and videos. Those are the things that they, they will want to target. I've given them Hamlet to use simply because I know that we have so many resources on Hamlet, it's not even funny. And that again is where that collaboration with your librarian can come in really handy. Because for example, in literature, there are some contemporary writers that the students really react very well to, but they are so contemporary that they have not been written a lot about in journals or magazines or anywhere else, other than sometimes a New York Times book review. But that's not a secondary source. Um, um, so that's where, you know, working with your librarians to locate potential sources before you tell the student, oh, you can write your research paper on any of the poems that you read this semester can really be important um, because sometimes it will be difficult to find true secondary sources. So Hamlet is not like that. Um, and just like Brenda in her, it, you know, showing them what a critique is, um, I give them the specifics about what an annotation is. So it is a single paragraph in which you give a summary of the source's points, an evaluation of the strength or credibility of the source, and then when possible, identify the main critical approach used in this source because they will have read a chapter called critical approaches. So if it's talking about Hamlet having depression, I would expect them to be able to say, aha, psychoanalytic criticism. Or if it's talking about um, poor, poor, poor um, the women in that, in that sad, sad, sad play, um, I would expect them to say, ooh, this is probably a gender studies oriented article. Um, so I'm not asking them, you know, to, to do an advanced literary critique, but I'm asking them to recognize certain key terms and phrases that will point to some of those those types of things. Um, this is one that I have not yet worked with Nora on, and so I'm going to be really brave and ask Nora if she has any suggestions on how even this could be strengthened. Right now? Yes. <laughs> it's on the fly? On the fly. Man, talk about putting me on the spot. I know. Uh, <laughs> my favorite person. Exactly. Um, <laughs> um, honestly, without delving into it deeper and actually trying it out, I would hesitate to tell you just off, off the top of my head. Uh, but I think um, providing a sample of an annotation here might give him give us a little bit more information about what it should look like um providing maybe a sample annotated bibliography would work mm -hmm. um so a video like you honestly you like you said about identifying the um main critical approach used in the source and what those critical approaches would look like that would be a good um place to go Let's see. I think actually the assignment is written well, and I think one of the things that would strengthen is to bring a librarian in to help you introduce it. And so that the librarian can take up some things. Um, so um, Sarah says to change a wording to say only use ebooks to be more clear. Mm. Um, and that could be, but if you want them to use any type of book, um, you know, that that also, you know, 
the the vagueness there is okay, I guess. Um, <laughs> well, partially that's because I don't know at what level our libraries will be in use by real people over the entire course of the semester. So, you know, I was writing it with pandemics in mind, uh, whereas in normal times, I would encourage them to go to the real library and look at real books. So um, that's why I put it the way I did. But I think that's a, an excellent point. I also, even as I'm sitting here looking at it, I almost think I want to add um, some non-library sources to the mix. Yes. And have um, them look at a couple of websites as well. And somebody's really paying attention because they asked, is this going to be a lead-in to another assignment? Or is it a standalone? So maybe um, adding a little bit about what the purpose of this right. assignment. I think that's... Um, and of course, that is, that is stated in the Canvas, in the module assignments, um, just not on the assignment sheet. But yeah, normally I wouldn't have them do this if it didn't lead up to a, a bigger paper. Um, this particular one is a standalone, again, because as it says, it this is module two. So their first research paper is due in module three. So this is literally just, I want them to practice using the library sources. I want them to practice citing things in MLA um, and that sort of thing. So that's the, way, that's the reason for this being a standalone. But I think in the perfect world, I absolutely agree. I would normally have this be something that then leads to a paper. Um, and I've done that before. I've actually provided, you know, here here are the sources I want you to use, and let's now write a paper um, early in the semester. I noticed we had some more in the chat, Nora. I saw the. Um, we're talking. We had a, a news update from Jane. Um, protesters have stormed the Capitol building. Oh, right. Security. Some waving Confederate flags. Woohoo! Yep, history's in the making right now. Fantastic. Scary stuff, right? Um, anyway, um, as related to our research, um, we answered the question about leading into the paper standalone annotated. Um, oh, we forgot to mention too, Nora, um, I do provide my own samples of what I want that to look like, but in, at least at the Lake Center Library, our boat, we have um, extremely good templates for students to use. Would you talk about what's in the Citation Center um, that helps support our faculty? Um, because at other institutions, they may or may not have something similar, but it might give them some ideas of what they might want to add. Yeah, um, in our Citation Center, um, we include examples for all types of resources for primarily MLA and APA styles. Um, and we have templates, um, how to format an MLA paper, where the student, all the student has to do is take the, inf take the formatting from that sample paper and insert their own materials and their own instruction and their own um, citations and everything. So they don't necessarily need to know how to format a paper. They can just um, use the templates to format their papers. They can also, have um they also have examples of annotated bibliographies we've provided sample citations sample in-text citations sample signal phrases you name it we've got a lot of stuff out there um citation is one of those things that students struggle with almost universally and we um have made an attempt to provide those resources for them um, to reiterate one thing that Jackie said, um, it's really kind of important to have samples, to provide things um, for the students to use just because when a librarian or a tutor is helping them, it makes it easier for us to know, right? I think it bears repeating. It makes it easier for us to help your students. So whatever we can do to have a you know a correct interpretation of what you want and what you really really want um, makes it much easier for us to help your students oftentimes students will come to us and they'll, I have to write a paper okay what's it about I don't know <laughs> who's your teacher oh uh, sometimes they don't even know that 
right? So <laughs> the more we can point them in the direction, and you never take their word for it either. Um, I, I think librarians in this group would agree with me that they get things confused all the time. Well, um, the teacher said it was okay for me to use Wikipedia. Who's your teacher? Miss Pierce. Yeah, it's not okay for you to use Wikipedia. <laughs> so be sure to know that um, this is going to help us help them. So. We are technically at the end of our time. Obviously, if you have questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, and if you want to go watch TV, I understand. <laughs> so, Jeremy. I see you're back with us. You probably yeah. want to go watch TV. I've been following some. I of figured. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, uh, we have 15 minutes between now and the next session, which is at 3 o'clock. Uh, so if anybody has any uh, questions for our presenters, we'll just sort of leave this open. Uh, Jean Franz asked about the template. Is the template flexible enough to let the student modify it without freezing its content? Yes, it is literally just a word-friendly document that is already an annotated bibliography or a paper. And at the Lake Sumter Library, we have both APA and MLA, um, and both of those documents are word-friendly. I like it because some students who just absolutely refuse to download Microsoft 365, even though they can do it for free, um, they're trying to use other word processing programs. And by having them open the template, um, it already tells me that, yes, you can, sh you, you do have the ability to create a word-friendly uh, document. Kristen makes the point, yeah, a lot of students are using Google Docs, which is fine. I mean, I get it. You know, I, I understand free. Free is one of my favorite things. Um, but I also, you know, it's it's one of those things where that itself is sort of discipline literacy. Um, getting the students to understand that as you go out into the bachelor's world or beyond, or you go even into the work world, you are going to be expected to do things in Microsoft Word. I'm sorry, but it just is the way it is. Um, you know, so that is, I think, even sometimes helping them download Office is part of that information literacy that we can help them with. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Kristen, you're absolutely right. Some of the, a lot of the schools are using Chromebooks, so they have no, they have no choice. Um, that is a, that is an excellent point. I, I mean, have found, you, go ahead. Mark. I have found that Google Chrome or Google Docs is way better than Word Online. You can do a lot more of the things. It's a little bit more cumbersome because there's a few more steps to creating, but once you've figured that out, it works actually better than Word Online. So if they have to use an online-based program for some reason, gear them towards Google Docs. And one of the things that is available on our Citation Center website is a Google Doc template. We do have that, Kristen. Um, we have uh, Google Docs instructions on how to use all those things. Um, actually, like, I'm not sure if we do have a Google Docs template or not, but you can open the Word template in Google Docs and it works perfectly. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. If they are using, because it is a real, it's real text, I think, uh, rather than actual DOCX. And right. so whatever they're using, they can, they should be able to open it in there. So encourage them to save it on their computer, go into whatever they use to type and then open it. And that should, that should solve that problem. Yeah. Um, I did paste these, um, the link in chat for the LibGuides with the Citation Center, and there are specific pages for MLA and APA style um, that are going to be available there for you all to reference as well. Thank you so much, you guys. I hope you have uh, found some helpful information, and uh, Nora and I are around if you need anything. Thank you very much, and thank you, Jeremy, for being our host. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Bye, guys. <laughs>